um, competition, but I think the feature engineering part in this competition is still very uh, inspiring. And then the second one is the grocery sales forecasting. And then the last one is more recent on uh, Walmart M5 forecasting. Many, uh, it, it has two competitions. One is on accuracy, the other one is on uncertainty. So we mainly talk about the uh, and uh, accuracy over here. Okay, so I uh, so for each of the competition, I pick mainly about two winning uh, winning solutions. Yeah, because they post their solution in the discussion forum, so some of it are not, are not that detailed, uh, documented. So I think all I'm talking about here is my best guess of how they uh, implement their solution. Uh, so first I will, I will introduce each of the competition. Uh, so the first one is the Roseman store sales. So it's a drug store in European countries. And uh, in, in their uh, data, they, they have about 1,100 1, stores. And then the task is to predict the daily sales of the stores for up to six weeks in other ones. And along with the data, they have many additional factors that can affect the sales, such as the promotion, competition, holidays, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think their data set is also very interesting to incorporate all this additional uh, information for the sales. So here is a more a detailed introduction to the data they provide. So the first is the historical sales, right? So you, you know a store, which store is that at what date? And you have the sales, that's the forecast or predicted variable, right? So what's the sales of a given day uh, within that store? And also how many customers uh, come and whether the store is closed or uh, open. And then there's also the state holiday and school holidays. I think, uh, the, yeah, so the holidays can affect the sales. Right? So they, it's good that they provide it along with the, with the data. And then for the, uh, and then, so this is more like each day, each store, how many sales and customers. And then they also provide the metadata for the stores. Right? So they have many four stores, and well, different store types. Uh, and different assortment. They also provide some competition of where the nearest competitor store is, uh, when that competitor store is open, and also whether that store is running some promotion. I, I think it's uh, uh, also very important to boost the sales if uh, there's a promotion of certain items. Uh, so all of this is uh, about uh, different uh, promotions information. So that's the data. And then uh, what's the metric? Because you know, for the Kaggle competition, they usually publish a metric that can automatically evaluate your submission. Right? And then you will get a score on their public leader leaderboard uh, during the competition phase. But in the end, you are going to be scored in their private uh, leaderboard. So the private Leaderboard, the data is kind of closed during your training phase. You don't know what data or, or, or the, that the data is not disclosed until the end of the competition. So, well, that score, they use this metric uh, is the root mean square percentage error. So this is more like a relative relative error. It's not, I think we, we are all familiar with the root mean square error, right? So that, that, that is basically without this division here. So this is like uh, the differences divided by the uh, absolute values of the original values. So, so this way, because different items can have different uh, amount of sales and you kind of normalize the errors in, in this way. So it's a, it's a squared of percentage errors. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let's look at some winning solution. Well, the first one, uh, I think the author documented pretty well. So it's mainly with lots of feature engineering. Uh, you see this competition, I think it's uh, six years ago, right? So I guess at that time, the, 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 the neural network is still not as popular as nowadays. 
uh, and also the model I I, is not as fancy as nowadays. So I think uh, most people will spend lots of time on the feature engineering. I think uh, even now the CACO competition will still require uh, lots of uh, feature engineering. I think that this, um, the first place really has done a great job in the feature engineering. So what features uh, did he generate, right? So there are many uh, five categories. Um, one is on more recent data, one is on temporal information, and also he extracts some trends, like model the trends, linear trends in the data. And of course, he used the store meta metadata, right? So the, the store types, assortment, et cetera, the competition information, et cetera. And then also some additional data, external data sources about the weather, like on that date, whether it's hot, what's the temperature and what's the uh, rain, whether there's the rainfall over there. Yeah, and this is the link where he published the feature extraction. So, so first uh, on the recent data, so it's, it's basically first, uh, you need to get a group of transactions. Right? So the group, well, you can group the data by this piece, right? Either by store, by day or week, by whether or not they have that promotion and by holidays. So you can group by the data uh, with this piece, right? And then you have many, many different groups. And then within each group, you extract certain time period from that data, right? So you can just uh, grab the previous months. So for all the data point, uh, you can get like all the premier, previous months, last quarter, last half year, et cetera, if, if it exists. Uh, and then for each of the extracted time series within that group, you, you calculate lots of stats for that time series, right? Such as the mean, median, uh, deviation, skewness, percentiles. So he basically generated lots of stats uh, for all these different time series within each of these groups. Yeah, so yeah, you can see the amount is huge you know, after you combine uh, the, the combination. Uh, this is more on the recent data, the statistics about uh, on the recent uh, data, the recent time period. And then there's some temporal information on, on the day, day counters, right? Because the data provide the, the holidays and events, the events including the promotions, holidays, whether the store has refer, refurbishment and also the uh, competition or promotion cycle, right? So you can actually count uh, the, the for, for a given day, you can count the number of days before, after, or within the event. So you can tell that day whether it's uh, it's uh, you know during an event, it's how many days before, or how many days after. And so this kind of tells uh, some more correlations with the events. And and of course within the date, you can extract like day of week and all this time related feature. Uh, and then uh, you can even count the number of holidays during current week, last week and next week. So, so it's like, I think it's another round of stats uh, regarding to the events. And then the trends. Uh, so they propose to use, according to the documentation, I think they train a specific linear model uh, so each store has a linear model on the last quarter time series or last year time series. And then the linear model is trained on the day number, day of week, and the promotions. And then, then you, you train a linear, linear uh, kind of model and then forecast into the, into the test, test, test set. Uh, so if there's the increasing trend or decreasing trend, and hopefully the linear model can capture can capture that. So, and then there are also other features such as the, the, the features from the store metadata such as assortment type. And also, of course, you can do another round of aggregates by store, right? So from that sales data, you can calculate what's the uh, average sales per customer, and you know, and then the ratio of sales 
during the promotion, like uh, like if there's a promotion, holidays, and uh, set, uh, and if it's the weekends, and then what's the what's the sales uh, kind of? It, it could it must increase, right? And then how much increase of sales during these uh, events? And then also for each of the store, what's their proportion that there's uh, holidays and also the days that the store is open. And then there's the state specific weather, right? So I think this is not provided by the competition, but they get some external data on uh, um, the temperature of max temperature and precipitations in that. Because I think if it's a bad weather, of course the sales will, the the, the sales will decrease according to the uh, bad weather, right? So, uh, and and of course to forecast into the future, you also need some reliable weather. So I guess they use some more of the historical weather there, but it's very hard to I think forecast the extreme weather for the future for the future days, right? So. But but I think it's I think uh, they find or some other um, participants find is find is some somewhat useful to incorporate some of the weather there. And they for the modeling they just use one model the GBM models. So for those who are not familiar with it, uh, this is just a very simple straightforward way to illustrate what's a gradient boosted trees. So basically you just first train some one tree in the beginning and then you just fit the data and then you calculate the residuals from the data, right? And then the residual is what your next tree is uh, training to reduce, right? So the, the, the and again, you, you get another round of improvement and then you fit the residual to the third tree. So it's kind of an iterative way to train the trees to reduce the errors or reduce the residuals from the last round. Yeah, I think this is the most, uh, well, this is the must have. It kind of becomes the must have uh, model in the winning solutions, no matter like if they, uh, if they don't ensemble or, or if they use multiple models or if they use just one model, almost every winning case has a GBM there as one of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for the model training, uh, they just use XGBoost. Uh, and then because the, the author says they generate lots of features, so they need to do some feature selection. So they just train the models on a random selection of features. Right, so the uh, and of course he also handpicked some models where he thinks makes sense, uh, and then basically he trained five hundred random models, and then also uh, uh, validate on um, each pair of the ensemble model. So they just like choose two of the models as peers, and then to and validate the results on that. And then they find the best models and then they take the features from all the best models uh, and then combine to one. So this is how they do the feature selection. Well, I think it's a little bit too overcomplicated, <laughs> but uh, they find it this way. They, they're able to uh, like kind of improve the performance, like kind of doing the feature selection and model ensembling at the same time. Uh, another trick they do is they separate models on the month from May to September. I think that I think this time period uh, covers the dates in the test. So they kind of specifically focus on the on the on the on the dates uh, that exist in the test uh, model. So they they train a separate models on that, and then they also train a month ahead models, like train for example use the. Uh, for, for example, using the months like January to March to forecast May, for example, right? So you can directly predict like months ahead models uh, using the historical data. Uh, and then they lock, because they lock transform the variable. Uh, uh, and then in the end, they, after transforming back, they find applying a multiplier factor of this will uh, improve the performance. I think this is also very uh, like uh, debated or discussed on the discussion forum of what factor to apply. And actually they'll also apply a 0.99 uh, 
to get the first place, but later they find out someone suggests a more kind of a theoretical uh, value of 0.985 to even further improve their performance. Yeah, so as I would say, this is just a magic, magical map uh, over there. Uh, and people find that like applying a multiply factor to adjust the number after the log transform back, uh, it, will, it will improve the performance. Yeah, so this is the, the uh, results. Uh, so the, the, the without feature engineering, they, they, they said that the, the improvements are nearly, you know, uh, very small. I mean, uh, small meaning like with the feature engineering, the improvement is not that great. Like the, without feature engineering is the black one and with the engineering is the red one. So the red kind of improves a little bit on the, on the black, but 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 they can uh, you know the the, the cargo leaderboard well you can you can just you know increase by by like a lot just increase your accuracy by 0 0.005 for example so so I would say you really need some luck to get to the top ten or top first place. <laughs> Uh, although, although uh, from this chart, although what we can tell is without that much feature engineering, we, we already get a very good enough result with the XGBoost model. Right? Uh, but I think from this winning solution, I think it gives us a very good inspiration of what features can be extracted uh, for, for your task. Okay, this is one solution. Uh, do you have any questions before we? Move to the next one. Okay, let's uh, move on to the, the to the next one. So the next one uh, is uh, is a third place solution, but I, I think I like this one a lot. Um, yeah, and they they also published a paper on that. I think back then the entity embedding is still not that popular, but they apply the entity embeddings for all the categorical features. And then they find out that the, actually the entity embedding can improve any, uh, any model uh, if you just use the embedding rather than additional values. So what is entity embedding? Well, you can think of it as the dimension reduction or as the compressed information uh, for the features. Right? For example, the store ID uh, is lots of IDs and originally it has over 1000 values. And then throughout the entity embedding, uh, throughout the embedding layers, you can end up with the 10, uh, 10 dimensions uh, for that ID, right? And then for each of the features, you can greatly reduce their dimension to, to below 10 uh, over here. So, and then after you extract the uh, embeddings, and then you can combine them with any methods, such as the KN random forest or any type. And then you can see that with the entity embeddings, they greatly improve the performance. That's what they find out over there. Like the, the even with the gradient boosty tree, with the embedding features, you can also greatly reduce the errors there. So the two tables, they show two tables. Well, the first table is on the shuffle data. So it's not, you just randomly select 90% for train and 10% for test. And uh, this is a little bit, I, I would say not fair for the time series, right? So you need to uh, split the data based on time. So the second table is kind of uh, split the data uh, based on time. So the test is the latest 10% of the data. So this is the more fair uh, evaluation for the time series. Yeah, so this is uh, the Roseman score competition. So because it's uh, six years ago, so I would say the, the, the competition, you can see the solution is more uh, focused on the features uh, a lot. Right? And, uh, and then later, as you see, uh, we, as we move on and more and more, models are ensembled and also more and more neural network get used over there. <laughs> okay, do you do you have any questions about the first competition or any thoughts, comments? 
Uh, hi, yeah, I actually hi. have a question about the uh, entity embedding. Uh, uh -huh. How do they do the uh, entity embedding? Do they use like language, uh, natural language processing or something else? Yeah, it's I think they, mm -hmm. yeah. So in the TensorFlow, you have the embedding layers, right? So, oh, so they, okay. they, yeah, so they basically, I think right now it's much easier to do the embedding, but back then they still need to one hot encode the variable and then they input it into the embedding layers and then concatenate them, them together through a simple neural network to, uh, to, to predict the cells. And then they just use the, 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 the output from the embedding layers. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on next to this uh, grocery sales forecasting. I think this is a grocery source uh, and uh, they, they have lots of items. And uh, yeah, so you see it's uh, three years ago. So that's after three years. <laughs> Of the Roseman store data, and uh, and I think this uh, this one is also a very challenging one. I think uh, grocery stores because they they focus a lot to uh, care for the, the perishable items, right? Because in the grocery, some items will kind of go out quickly, right? So they they uh, and they 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 care about that in their metric calculation. So as always, let's first look at the data. Uh, so the data they provide is first the unit sales by date. So the unit sales is uh, for that store, for that item at that date. Right? So what's the unit sale of that item at that date? And also they have the promotion column to tell whether that item is um, promotion or not. And also, of course, some store metadata of, of where the store is located, like city state type. Etc., and also the item metadata, including the family, uh, uh, and also whether that item is perishable, such as the vegetables, right? Uh, and then the uh, the count of sales transaction for each date uh, and store combinations. So how many sales uh, given a store and given that date? And they also include the oil price. That's very interesting. <laughs> For the forecast, yeah, I guess the oil price will affect lots of uh, stuff. <laughs> uh, I think some some items will depend on the oil price, oil price a lot, uh, and then the the holiday and the events with the metadata. Right? So what's that holiday? What's the events? What's the type, etc. So you can see that when they collect their data, it's interesting to see that they store this uh, what additional data they store for their forecast problem. So I think the, the, the metric they design is, uh, is very interesting. At least I haven't used this kind of metric before. So it's called a normalized weighted root mean squared log error. <laughs> so, so it's a log. So it's basically a log of the relative error, right? So it's log minus is equals to log this divided by this. So it's still kind of the percentage error, uh, but it is taken log. And then it's, it's weighted, right? So for the perishable items, it given a higher weight of 1.25, while the other items given a weight of one. Uh, and also there's some articles discussion about the, this metric. And uh, they, they say that this metric incurs a larger penalty for the underestimation uh, than the overestimation. Uh, for example, if we uh, fix, I think they fix the value, fix the Y to be, for example, 500, if I remember correctly, and then they just uh, vary the Y hat, say from nine, from 100 to 900, right? With respect to 500. And then they calculate the metric. And then you can see that if, if the Y hat is uh, like underestimates a lot, and then the error will like increase greatly. While if you overestimate, the error doesn't increase that much. Right? So, 
So they, so the metric really puts a uh, lot of focus on the uh, penalties on the underestimation. Same chart here is RMSE that we all commonly use. Well, RMSE is more symmetric and it penalizes both sides equally. I think it's very interesting to, <laughs> to look at different metric and to see like what area of focus, uh, uh, what area of uh, error it focuses on. So the first solution, well, I would say the first solution is a little bit, uh, well, it's hard to, to dig out all the details. And also the, the authors say they are very lucky <laughs> to get the first place because I think uh, they, they use lots of uh, codes that is already published on the Kaggle kernel. So, so, so they, uh, uh, they, I mean, the overall, uh, they, they train lots of uh, models. So they, for example, they, they train uh, uh, one model for each day uh, because in time there are 16, 16 days. So they train one separate a light GBM, so it's also a GBM model uh, for each day, and also uh, a neural network model for each day, and also like one one model for 16 days together rather than separately, and then one uh, model. Right? So of course, you if you train like for each day overall, you get a better performance. But in the end, they even like ensemble like a linear blend of the four four models together to get. You see the improvement is actually. Uh, negligible, right? So just point, point there, there too. Well, but it matters to the to the ranking. <laughs> so so uh, then I mainly look at the first solution because I feel like this is the closest one to this, and also they put a lot of weight on the first one. And then with respect to the feature engineering, I think it shares a lot of similarity with the Roseman four uh, features. Right, so of course they use some basic features like uh, categorical features like the store item, what's the item family class of the promotion, also the day of week. Uh, and of course they, again, uh, generate lots of statistical features, right? As in the Roseman store, like we have the keys and the key right now is the store item and item. And then we have, uh, we extract the time series within these uh, groups uh, generated by the keys. Right? So we have these uh, time windows. Uh, we do the, uh, find the nearest day, like uh, actually the one, they, they shift the days by 28 days because it, it is required to, to forecast into, I think it's uh, uh, 28 days. So they do some uh, shift and then they find the last one day, last three days, last five days, uh, or, or even like two months ago, right? So they just directly extract the sales like several, like this many days ago. And then they do a equal time window and then extract the stats within each time window. And then what stats they calculate on, they calculate on promotions on sales and also how many zeros uh, in the data. And then the stats they calculated, including this many, like mean, median, max, and also days since last appearance, because some items are not that frequently purchased. So there will be lots of zeros. And then it, it extracts how many days since last appearance. And also like the difference of mean value between adjacent time windows, right? So basically, again, it's very similar to those men store. So they generate lots of groups and then extract time series based on these uh, days and windows. And then for these target variables, they, they calculate all these statistics for those target variables. And of course, they also use the, uh, the holidays and they also have tried other keys such as cluster, item, store, family, et cetera, but they find it not that useful. <laughs> so they call it uh, useless features. Yeah, but they, they mentioned they have tried them out on the, and then this, uh, this whole as uh, input to the light GBM model. And again, because they, they train 16, right? So they train one GBM for each day uh, in the test. Well, I, I would say it will be, uh, with, with this small gap, I don't think it's worth implementing 16 
models in practice, I mean, in real model deployment, but for the competition, they, <laughs> they train 16 ways to, to get this many improvement uh, over there. Mm. Uh, another, uh, so this is one solution on GBM models. And then I, I find uh, lots of models, uh, they, they use the uh, convolutional neural network to do the forecasting. So that's to my surprise, and they actually get very good results with that. So the fourth place model is uh, encoder decoder with the dilated causal convolutions. And they, they claim that this, they do a good job because the causal convolutions uh, comparing to RSTM or other recurrent neural network model, it can encode much lo longer sequence uh, with this dilated, right? For example, uh, this, uh, these dots can, by, by stacking them up, this dot can encode a very long time, time, uh, time series, right? So uh, within the, by this uh, dilated uh, convolutions. And also because it's time series, so it only use the, you know, historical data rather than, you know, an ordinary convolution that is symmetric. So, but, but for time series, it's only using the uh, historical, historical time points. So they build an encoder decoder with the, with this type of structure. And also, I think they also use a bidirectional RSTM with that. So it's a, it's a one model. Uh, but with the, you know, but with the neural network model, right? But it can, you know, example different type of neural structures within that one model. So I would say still multiple models uh, within one solution. And the fifth fifth place is also very interesting. It's uh, it's uh, definitely another example model. So first they use the GBM models, uh, more features, the data and peers uh, into the model. And then they use uh, CN plus DN. So the CN is a dilated causal. So it's what I introduced just now uh, of the dilated causal convolution uh, installed by the WaveNet. So if you are interested in this structure, so maybe it's good to read about the WaveNet. Uh, and then they use the DN to connect to the, to the uh, raw cells uh, sequences. So the DN is directly another uh, kind of to process the raw cell sequences. And then the inputs are concatenated together with the embeddings and promotions to output to the future days, like 16 days, uh, future days of the prediction. And then they train another RN. I think this is from another uh, structure of the Kaggle, Kaggle winning solutions uh, for the web traffic prediction. Encoder and decoder GIUs, yeah. So, Yes, yeah, so I would say they, they, they train kind of three types of models and do an example of them. Well, it will be hard to say like till the last minute, like how many, like at what place you will end up with. Uh, again, uh, and it's, uh, uh, I would say like for the top 1% to, to rank as the top 1%, well, you need lots of effort, but to rank as the top 10 or top, five, well, you really need some luck there <laughs> to get, because everyone were, were doing the, the, the examples are doing a very similar like feature engineering. Right? So it's, uh, it's hard to say till the last minute. Yeah, so I will say for this competition, again, the lesson from that is still the features are important, especially for the GBI models and people start to use uh, the CNs uh, for the for the for the predictions. So let me pause over here to answer any questions or comments on this one before we move to the M M five. Okay, now let's move to the M5 forecasting. So it's uh, to estimate the unit sales of Walmart goods. And it's uh, like one year ago, I think everyone is familiar with Walmart, so don't, I don't need to <laughs> introduce that a lot. Uh, 
And then the data they have is uh, first, so they have multiple uh, CSVs. So the first CSV is about the dates the products are sold. And so the uh, the week, whether it's the weekday, uh, and also the idea of the day starting from Saturday, the month, the year, and whether there is a date includes an event, and what's the name and type of the event. And many the the stores are in CA Texas or WI, so they so this is a binary variable indicating uh, whether the stores of this uh, allow snap purchases on the exam date. Yeah, I need to check what's a snap purchase. Uh, and then they have provided the prices. I think this is some additional uh, and also different from the earlier competitions. So they also provide the pricing information of the products. So we have the store item, we have the week, and we have the sale price. So the price of the product for the given week for store. Uh, and of course the price is, uh, is average across seven days per week. And then in the training data, we, we mainly have the sales, right? So we have the how many unit sales per product and store. So we have the item ID, department ID, uh, the product categories, and the, the, the store IDs, and also the, the sales of the, of the item at that store, like from day one to day uh, nearly 2000. Uh, okay, so that's the introduction to the data. So remember, we have the date information. We have whether that date has event or uh, or holiday, and then we have the pricing information of that item. And also for the trains, we have the uh, uh, how many unit uh, units that, that items are sold at that store for this many days. Okay, and then the metric again, it's very interesting. <laughs> uh, it's called a weighted root mean squared scaled error. So I would say it's more like a, a normalized error, right? So they have the nominator here. Well, nominator is very easy to understand. So if you are going to forecast H steps or half, right? So you can just, uh, for your YT, and then you just comparing it to the uh, ground truth to the ground truth, right? And then for the, and then of course divided by how many days it's generated. And for the denominator, well, in the beginning I said, what's this denominator, right? So actually it's a very naive model, just like forecast one step a half. Right? So for example, you directly use uh, the one day ago as your forecast. So that's a very, you can think of as a baseline model. Right? So they basically comparing the arrows with respect to the baseline, like the last day forecast model. So they do the normalization and then take the square root of that. So that's why it's called a scaled error of that. Yeah, H is the forecasting horizon. Yeah, I think this, uh, again, is a very interesting metric that I have never used before. But I think it includes, it, it, it can tell you like how much improvement with respect to the one step forecast baseline. Okay, so first let's look at the first place solution. Again, it's a single, it's a single LGBM model. And the interesting part is uh, the objective is treaty. Uh, I haven't used this objective or loss function before. And I specifically look into this treaty uh, objective. It turns out that for the problem, if you have say lots of zeros, uh, lots of zeros, and then you have this kind of distribution, then treaty objective is, uh, is a very good choice for that. And so, so you don't need to throw away the zeros because it's going to uh, modeling zeros as well. So if you are forecasting like the sales of items or if you are forecasting the number of claims, for example, for the insurance claims where you have lots of zeros uh, in your distribution, the treaty objective is a good choice. 
Uh, and again, they divide into groups with similar time series and model it, right? So for different stores, for different store categories, et cetera, they train a different model. I think it's a very similar idea to the last competition where you have 16 days. They, they train a separate model for each day. While here they train a, a different model for different stores, for different store categories, et cetera. Yeah, and, and then they select the final model using the mean. Well, mean is very easy to understand. And they also consider the variation of the models. And so they have multiple validation set and they also see like uh, 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 the variance of the performance. Uh, and this is also very interesting. So it's an example of non-recursive and recursive models. So for the, for the uh, recursive one, well, you just train one model, right? And then like from, uh, from uh, like the T minus one, T minus two to T minus N, and you predict uh, T, predict the, I think it should also include, Uh, and then you pre you predict t plus one, and then when you're going to predict t plus two, you are directly include like your previous output is becoming your input into the model. So we call this this is a recursive model. So for the non-recursive, it's kind of more like a direct prediction, right? So you directly predict t plus one, t plus two, while your model output doesn't serve as the input into the model. So. And then, then they, when they uh, validate their model, they find that on some certain time period, recursive do a better job and on certain period, non-recursive one wins. So in the end, they just do an example of them. So that's very interesting discovery <laughs> of what they found. So what features they, they extract, right? Uh, uh, again, uh, for the store item price, they extract like max mean uh, variations. Then they also do the normalized price divided by the price max. And also they count the number of uniques of the price. Right? And they also have for the same price, what's the number of unique items and also the price momentum. So they, they, they extract lots of uh, stats about the prices for that item, uh, given that store and item. And then there's this uh, calendar features where we have the day, week, uh, the year index, weekend, and of course the event and state. Okay. And then of course, I uh, just as the previous competition, well, <laughs> well, they also uh, generate lots of tem temporal, temporal information, temporal features, right? They, they, are, they also use the uh, lag features, the uh, rolling features, Right. The lag features is just directly extract the cells like how many days ago, right? So they first do a 28 day shift. So because I think it's going to forecast for one month. So they first do a, a shift uh, of eight, 28 days back and then they extract like what's the cells so one day ago, two days ago, three days ago, two, 14 days ago. And then the rolling features is a fixed time window of seven, a fixed window of 14, and then they do the rolling mean and uh, STD. And also the rolling with shift. Uh, shift is like you move how many days back and then start the rolling process. Uh, and this is also very interesting. Well, they, they, they do uh, mean encoding features, like because you have so many different uh, like stores, categories, right? And then they just, for each of the IDs or different groups. Right? So you define a group by state, by store, by category, by item, and then you extract the stats within each groups. So they call it the mean encoding features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say this uh, solution, well, they again generate lots of stats about the prices, uh, about the sales, uh, temporal stats, and then they generate lots of uh, like uh, stats or uh, features with respect to each groups. And then for the models, it's a single LGBM models. And then they do the example of non-recursive and recursive. 
yeah, that's the first place solution. And I really like the idea of the second place. Well, it's aligning top and bottom. Uh, why we need aligning top and bottom? So the bottom is we directly predict at the lowest level. The lowest level is the store and item level, right? So, so, so you can directly predict uh, given a store, given item. But uh, we can also do uh, like aggregate them, aggregate them up. For example, we can aggregate them all together. Well, you have this time series. And also you can aggregate them to the space. Well, you have this like three states, so three this time series. So when we uh, aggregate the low, the bottom level up, uh, we really want to match the high level uh, time series as well, right? So, so the idea they 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 uh, point out is first they do a bottom level prediction, where they do an LGBI model for each store, and they they haven't tried the lag or only stats. So there's no uh, stats because they think that aligning top and bottom will do the trick there. And then they align the, these bottom models to the top levels. The top levels including all. So it's like aggregate all, everything together according to the day. And then they also top level including the states according to the store. So they have uh, about 10 stores there. Right? So they just aggregate by store and want to align with this 10 time series there. So uh, yeah, so they, the, the basic idea is they, they, they predict at lowest level and then align with the top. Uh, and, uh, and then I think they, uh, they use some magic, they modify the, the loss or the objective that is going to be passed into the LGBM model. <clears throat> So they, they basically modify the gradient and the hessian uh, for the for the that has to be provided for for the customized objective. Well, you need to return the gradient and hessian, and it's a it's a a, a symmetric uh, loss. Uh, for example, if the residual well the predicted value comparing to your true value, so if the residual is smaller than one, uh, means you are kind of. Uh, uh, Overestimate, right? so the residual is uh, smaller than one, then the, your predict is higher than your true value. And then uh, if it's true, and then it's, uh, it's like directly multiplied by uh, negative two, but if it's underestimate, then it will, um, you will multiply by a magic multiplier. Well, this multiplier, they train it from 0.9 to 1.23. So what it means is uh, if the multiplier is uh, larger than one, you, you, you tend to over, overshot, overfit. And if the multiplier is smaller than one, so if it's equal one, then it's symmetric, right? So then it's symmetric. And if it's smaller than one, it will, it will tend to under, underfit. So that's how they uh, they want to kind of adjust the low level prediction with that. Same, the mag multiplier applies to the, the Hessian uh, over here. Right. So they basically, as they mentioned, they build a set of bottom level models with the different multipliers. Uh, that is basically uh, define your, their objective. And then they find the optimal setting of that. Uh, is somewhat, somewhere around 0.93 to 0.95. So they build an example of this set of uh, values. And actually this, this loss function is not come up by them. Actually it's a very hard discussion in the forum. So they, everybody's saying uh, this can, can help with the performance and then they pick this uh, customized objective and then they tune the multiplier so that they can get aligned with the top, top levels uh, forecast. So for the top levels, uh, they use a different model to predict because at the lowest level, it's quite sparse, right? So LGBM models uh, fit over there, but over here uh, at high level, you can get more data points and then you can directly model a time series at high level, right? 
so they use the NBIT model, so you can check it out. Uh, I think it's a very uh, popular neural network model uh, for the for time series. And you can direct, you can train uh, very easily uh, an NBIT model with this package. Uh, it's a probabilistic time series modeling. So it can give you the, the, the forecast into future along with the uncertainty around that. Yeah, feel free to check it out, the, this package. So they use the NBIS model to forecast at the high level. And then with that multiplier tricks, they want to align their uh, low level, the store uh, item level prediction with the high level. So this is what they show as the top, as the level one, right? So you aggregate everything together uh, by the date over here. So you can see the n bits. So this is the n bits, the high level prediction. And then this is their low level prediction. And then they aggregate the map. So they match with each other fairly well, I would say. Um, yeah, so they, so this is at one level. And again, at level two, level three, you will have, could have a different, uh, could have a different multiplier. So that's why in the end, they, they, they build an example with a different multiplier because for different levels, it could be that the multiplier, multiplier is, uh, is different, right? So they kind of uh, do, in the end, they do an example of them uh, to kind of compromise of like different uh, high level information. Yeah, so that's my, uh, and, and for this competition, they also have, uh, I think, published many other uh, winning solution solutions. Uh, like I think third place, fifth place is over there uh, because they have lots of overlap and I really like the different ideas. So I feel like the second place is uh, very, uh, you know, inspiring ideas of, how we want to adjust the low level prediction to match with the top. So it's, uh, I think it's a fair, fair idea. And then, uh, and I'm glad to see that it can get uh, very uh, good results uh, without too much speech engineering, I would say. Uh, yeah, so any uh, comments, questions before I move to the last, uh, kind of the secret slides of <laughs> what's, the, what's the secrets of winning this kind of solutions. Or what, at least what I have learned from reading this uh, winning solutions for the store sales forecast. Uh, yeah, you can also leave, uh, like you can either unmute yourself or you can also leave your questions uh, in the chat anytime. <laughs> uh, so I think my key takeaway uh, from the store, <clears throat> from the sales forecast, retail sales forecast. Uh, the first I, I realized the data is the key, right? So in addition to the sales data, uh, I think the promotions, competitions, holidays, events are also very important to store along with the sales data. Right? So if you are going to formulate uh, a forecast problem with respect to sales, consider uh, storing this type of data as well in the beginning. Uh, and also throughout these three competitions, they use three different uh, metrics. I think uh, even to, to, to myself, uh, our MSC is always the first metric to use uh, for, the, for the time series or maybe, right? Uh, it's really surprising that like all these three different competitions use three different uh, metrics and each of the metric you, you needs to be customized for different problems, right? So if you are really care about, for example, for the grocery, uh, forecast, you really care about the perishable items, so you need to put more weight uh, for the perishable items. Uh, the statistical features can be helpful. Uh, a lot of the winning solutions generate lots of statistical features by the lag, by the rolling mean uh, for different groups, uh, right? So the groups can be defined by stores, by locations, uh, by types. 
Right. So, so I would say, well, the statistical features can be helpful, uh, can be extracted as the input to the GBM models. Uh, the GBM model is still the most popular model for prediction. Uh, even nowadays, when the neural network gets really <clears throat> popular, and I would say I still see uh, GBM plays a very important role there, here and there, uh, as a single model or as the examples, as one of the example models. Uh, and then I also realized that separate models may be needed for different stores, different locations, and even duration of days. For example, if your summertime have uh, have uh, like you usually have your promotion in during summertime, and also summer is the vacation time, right? So maybe you want to separate your time series out, just focus on the summertime to to boost the performance for that period of time. Uh, uh, and also low level prediction can be improved by aligning with the high level prediction. Right? At low level, it's, it's, it's hard to do the time forecast because the data can be sparse and you can get lots of zeros. Uh, but we can do the time series forecast at high level, right? And then we can somewhat like adjust our low level prediction to align with the high level. And that will give us a better performance uh, overall. So that's my key takeaway.